Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Um, my name is Cooley. I'm the Targeted Outreach Director for the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. We have a lot of really great information, but before we start, I'm going to give everyone another one, two minutes to get logged in. Um, I know some people are just getting off of work um, or, or trying to get on, and it usually takes a little bit of time. So again, just to be patient, another one or two minutes before we get started. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started. Again, hello and welcome. My name is Ku Lee. I am the Targeted Outreach Director for the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Um, welcome to our Student Loan Workshop webinar. I wanna introduce the panelists that will be presenting information to you. Um, first, we have Selena Damien. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Selena Damien, and I am the Student Loan Servicing Ombudsperson Person at the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Thank you for being here this evening, this afternoon. Hi, everyone. Samantha Sang, the Legislative Director and Policy Advisor at NextGen Policy, uh, working to help borrowers throughout the state, and I'll pass it on to Cody. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really happy to be here. This is Cody Hunanian. I am the executive director of the Student Debt Crisis Center. We are a nonprofit. We have about 2 million supporters across the country dedicated to ending the student debt crisis. And core to our work are these types of education and outreach programs and workshops. So very happy to be here. This is a really rewarding part of our work to help you all. Thank you, Cody. Um, I do want to put out a special thank you to uh, the legislative offices, specifically Assembly Member Eloise Reyes, Assembly Member Richard Bloom, and also Assembly Member Joaquin Arumbla uh, for helping us put this webinar on. We will be um, getting a message from them here in a minute. But first, I want to talk um, about just to give you a quick disclaimer about this webinar. This webinar is being recorded and we will be publishing it to our YouTube channel. A link to the recording of this webinar will be emailed to you. Um, so you could rewatch it, you could share it with others. Um, for this webinar, your microphone, your video and chat has been disabled. Um, but if you do have any questions, please submit it through the Zoom's Q&A feature. Um, and then some of my panelists will be able to answer your questions as we go. Uh, but we do have a dedicated um, Q&A session at the very end of the webinar, we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, also, finally, you know, a lot of this information is changing even today. Um, but as of today, uh, the, the information that we're presenting this webinar is the most up to date. Okay. Um, first up, I'd like to 
Uh, I'd like to introduce Assemblymember Richard Balloon. He has a special message or some remarks for you. Oh, thank you, Q. Uh, uh, very kind of you. And good evening to uh, all of you. We have uh, over 100 participants uh, in the Zoom right now. So uh, uh, quite good participation in, in, in this very important and timely topic of uh, how to go about uh, applying for student loan uh, forgiveness. Since 1980, the costs of both public and private higher education have almost tripled, while federal financial support has failed to keep up. Pell Grants used to cover about uh, two thirds of the cost to attend a public university for a student from a working family. Now it only covers about a third of that cost. So there's a, a huge delta there and one that has to be covered. Today, federal student loan debt stands at upwards of $1.6 trillion for almost 45 million borrowers. And like many of you are here tonight, um, there are many people who need and deserve student loan relief in order to live a happier, fuller life without steep financial burden. With numerous changes to federal student loan programs in the last year under the Biden administration, culminating in potential debt cancellation, there's a lot of conflicting information out there, and we want to be sure that you are all prepared. But of course, President Biden just made announcements about this yesterday, so this topic is very important, very current. Uh, I'm really happy that when we've been able to partner with the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, Next Gen Policy, and my incredible colleagues, Eloise Reyes and Joaquin Arambula. Um, we're all bringing you tonight's program, which will go over the latest changes to student loan forgiveness so that you're informed and prepared for the upcoming deadlines. Uh, thank you all for being here. I will now turn it back to Q. Uh, thank you, Assemblymember Bloom. Um, next, I'd like to present uh, Assemblymember Eloise Reyes, who is also the Majority Leader. Thank you so much, Q. It's so great to be on this Zoom with my colleagues, with Assemblymember Bloom and Assemblymember Arambula, and with all of you. Uh, I, I'm Eloise Reyes, and I'm the assembly member that represents the 47th Assembly District. This includes most of the communities here in San Bernardino County, from Grand Terrace and Colton to San Bernardino, Rialto, Fontana, and some unincorporated areas. I've got to tell you that it's an absolute pleasure to partner with NextGen, whatever whenever we're trying to bring such an important topic to light, student loans, and making sure that we recognize, I want you all, the students, I want you to know that we understand that these student loans are confusing at times. The language is confusing, and I, I get it. It's stressful figuring out what type of loans that you qualify for, and the interest rates are always changing. So many borrowers find themselves completely confused over differences between subsidized and unsubsidized loans, making it feel impossible to know how to pay everything back. This year, and I appreciate that my colleague, Assemblymember Bloom, just mentioned it, President Biden announced the loan relief program that would assist those that need it the most. And while this is a start, legislatures are now realizing that student loans are, they really are a mystery to almost everyone. And it's our responsibility to make the student loan system more manageable and comprehensive for all of our constituents. I, I want you to all know that you're not alone. Having NextGen present this is extremely important. And as Assemblymember Bloom said, very timely. We are now in the process of providing more information about this, the, the debt relief that has been brought now uh, from President Biden. And that process, as we're finding, is actually easy. But today we're gonna to talk about the loans themselves and what, what you as students and as parents need to know. And again, I'm just so glad that NextGen is putting this on. If any of you are in my district and ever need any assistance, please know that you can count on us. You can call us at 909-381-3238. My staff and I are here for you. Thank you so much and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Assemblymember Reyes. Um, and finally, I'd like to give a, a moment for uh, uh, Assemblymember Joaquin Arambula. 
Good afternoon. Thank you all for attending today. I am proud to partner with the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, as well as NextGen and uh, Majority Leader Reyes and Assemblymember Bloom to bring this free webinar to you. With the recent announcement by the Biden-Harris administration on student loan forgiveness, we wanted to ensure that you are up to date on how to apply and the important upcoming deadlines which is why we are holding this wor workshop, is to make the process as easy as possible. We want to encourage you to share this information with your friends and colleagues. And again, wanna welcome you to today's Student Loan Workshop webinar. Back to you, Ku. Thank you, Assemblymember Rambula. Um, let me share my screen and let's go ahead and jump into the content. There's a lot of really uh, great and fantastic information. Okay, uh, all right. And from here, I'd like to hand it off to Samantha. Samantha. Hi, everyone. And thank you again to all of our assembly members who worked hard to get this crucial information out to constituents across California. As they all said, this is there's a lot out there. It's confusing. And thank you for taking the time um, to get this important information. So really quickly about some of us who are here on the call. Um, this is also co-hosted by the Campaign for California Borrowers Rights, which is a leading statewide coalition of students, higher education advocates, borrower protection organizations, and borrowers who are advocating for uh, progressive changes statewide, locally, and across the nation um, to make sure that the level, the, the playing field is level for student borrowers to see a debt-free future. Uh, the coalition is co-led by the Student Borrower Protection Center. Student, get, student Debt Crisis Center, which Cody is here with us today from that organization. Uh, Next Gen California, Next Gen Policy, that's us. Consumer Reports and Young Invincibles. So we're happy to be here to uh, put on this uh, webinar with our great partners at DFPI and our assembly members. So I will pass it off to Selena now. Thank you, Sam. Well, first I'd like to start with talking about just briefly who DFPI is and some of our responsibilities. DFPI is California's Consumer Protection Agency. Uh, the California Consumer Financial Protection Law is a law that was passed in 2020 and it expanded DFPI's authority to oversee previously unregulated providers of financial products. Um, this includes fintech companies, paycheck lenders, debt collectors, and student loan servicers. In addition, it also changed the name of DFPI. We were formerly known as Department of Business Oversight. So you may have not heard the DFPI, the recent name change. In regards to student loan servicers, it gave us the authority to license and examine these companies to ensure compliance. DFPI accepts and investigates consumer complaints and borrower complaints. We take legal action when companies are not in compliance. We conduct education and outreach such as this one to enhance consumer and borrower awareness and to protect, protect consumers from fraud and abuse. Next, please. So what does student loan debt look like in California? There are 4 million Californians that owe $156 billion in both federal and private student loan. Most of the debt is federal loan. 35 to 49 year olds owe the most debt on average. The average debt load of a California borrower is $37,000. And student loan debt disproportionately impacts people of color with black women having the most debt. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, approximately 500,000 borrowers were behind on paying their student loans. And as assembly member mentioned, in the United States, student loan debt is totaling nearly $2 trillion and is now the second highest consumer debt category after mortgages, which is why we are in this student loan debt crisis we are in. Next, please. So student borrowers do have some federal protections on the federal level. level. These are um, in the Higher Education Act, but these weren't enough. Um, California needed to step up and provide additional protections for borrowers. So in addition to CCFPL in 2020, California introduced 
and passed the California Student Borrower Bill of Rights. It was introduced as Assembly Bill 376 and it became effective January 1st of 2020. It applies to student loan servicers doing business in California, including state licensed servicers, as well as banks doing servicing. And it applies to borrowers with both federal and private loans, which is not a protection on the federal level. California is only one of 13 states that has this established advanced legislation to strengthen the oversight of student loan servicers and to protect borrowers. What does it do? It prohibits servicers from engaging in abusive, unfair, and deceptive practices. Servicers are required to work in the best interests of borrowers and provide accurate information about repayment plans, about forgiveness options, forgiveness plans, um, accurate information and keeping accurate account history, um, being able to serve students, serve borrowers and ensure that they do not fall into delinquency or default. Additionally, it established special protections for military borrowers, borrowers working in public service, older borrowers, and those with disabilities. It also established my position, the California Student Loan Ombudsperson position. As the ombudsperson, I work with federal agencies, state agencies, agencies such as NextGen and Student Debt Crisis Center to find out what is going on, the trends, what is going on with student loan borrowers, get the most updated information with all the updates coming down from the Department of Education. Um, we, I serve as that uh, the go-between. I m make sure that DFPI knows what's going on and therefore we can protect borrowers. We can uh, provide more over oversight to servicers. I do, uh, outreach and education such as this one. I work with educational associations, financial literacy centers, any nonprofit organization that needs the support and wants to learn. Um, and then additionally, I also work with student borrowers. On a daily basis, I answer questions from borrowers and help them understand their rights and their options. Next, please. Before we jump into the updates, I just want to give a brief overview about the difference between federal and private loans. This is going to be very important for borrowers to understand when they are trying to decide what action to take in regards to these relief and forgiveness programs. Um, first off, federal loans. Federal loans are those that are um, provided the, the by the Department of Education. Your lender is the Department of Education for federal loans. Um, you, all borrowers have direct loans. These are loans that are have fixed interest. You have your subsidized and your unsubsidized loans. Um, the subsidized loans are ones where the government pays the interest while the borrower is in school. So direct subsidized loans do not start accruing interest until a borrower leaves school, graduates, um, or, or moves on if uh, less than half time. So at that point, interest starts accruing. Um, unsubsidized loans, the borrower pays all interest from the time of disbursement. So these loans add the accrued interest to the loan balance, increasing the size and ultimate cost of the loans. But these are both federal loans. Um, direct PLUS loans, you have your, direct, your PLUS grad loans and your PLUS parent loans. Both of these have fixed interest rates. They are unsubsidized and they do have origination fees. Credit check is required for these type of loans. Grad loans are available to students pursuing graduate degrees and to parents of undergraduate students. Then you have your direct consolidation loans where a borrower can consolidate all their federal student loans into one single loan with a single servicer and a fixed interest rate. There is no cost to the borrower to consolidate, but it may increase the total balance of a loan. Then you have your FAL or federal family education loans. These, are, these were discontinued in 2010 um, but are subsidized loans made by a private lender and insured by the Department of Education. There are still many borrowers that carry these type of loans, which is why we mention them. Perkins loans are also subsidized loans and these are based on financial need. These were also discontinued in 2017, but the same, a lot of borrowers still carry these type of loans. Next, please. 
Then you have your private loans. Private loans are made by a lender such as a bank, a credit union, a state agency, or a school. They're not funded or subsidized by the federal government. They do not, do not offer the flexible repayment terms and forgiveness options provided by federal student loans. They offer, often require an established credit record and a co-signer. And it's important to know that once you refinance your federal loans into a private loan, you cannot revert back to a federal loan. So it's just very important that a borrower just understands the terms and um, the terms of refinancing, although every borrower situation will be different. Next, please. And just so you may have seen some of these names, so borrowers are aware some of the federal servicers, current federal servicers are Mojila, Nelnet, Navient, and Great Lakes. Mojila is also the PSLF or Public Service Loan Forgiveness Servicer. Private servicers, you have Navient again, who does both federal and private, SoFi, Sally May, and any bank or credit union such as Wells Fargo or Discover. Next. And now I will pass it over to Cody for our federal student loan updates. Great, thank you so much, Lena. And obviously thank you and your team for all the work you do on the accountability and uh, protection side of our work. Um, you know, pr protecting borrowers often starts with this type of education and awareness work. And our work has been more complicated over that last year because there were so many updates and changes at the same time, so much of these updates are really intended to uh, provide benefits and relief to borrower. In fact, they've been benefits that borrowers depend on. So many of you are likely aware that under the CARES Act, which was the pandemic relief bill passed by Congress in March of 2020, federal student loan payments for most borrowers have been paused. And that payment pause has been extended several times. As of now, Payments for these federal student loans are on pause until the end of this year with payments resuming on January 1st. On top of that, with the payment pause, there's also been a, a pause on the interest accrual and there has been a halting of debt collection practices. So not only did student loan borrowers not have to worry about their payments during the pandemic, they didn't see their loan balances skyrocket and increase over time. and they got a reprieve, many for the first time ever, from the harassing phone calls and letters and all the other uh, debt collection practices that can really be a drain not only on their, their time and family resources, but also you know, on their mental health. So uh, this type of relief has been in place automatically since March of 2020. This applies to borrowers with direct federal loans and also other types of federal loans that are held by the Department of Education. So that includes some federal family education loans or FFEL loans. And it also includes some Perkins loans, which are uh, a different kind of federal student loan as well. Uh, on top of all these benefits, there are other uh, requirements. So the student loan servicing companies uh, were instructed to report uh, to repeating, excuse me, to credit reporting agencies that the this pause on payments should be seen as uh, on time payments. Um, but all of these benefits, unfortunately, right now, are set to expire in January of 2023. So that's really important because what borrowers need to be aware of is that after January 1st of 2023, it's time to start enrolling in other federal repayment programs and becoming aware of all the options that are available to you. And we'll talk about some of those options shortly. Another update, uh, one that frankly hasn't gotten as much attention because there's so much happening around us when it comes to student debt cancellation, but the Department of Education has announced that they will be performing a one-time account adjustment for those of us who are enrolled in income-driven repayment plans. Uh, and what this means is that borrowers who have been uh, what we call steered into long-term forbearances will be able to actually have these monthly payments count 
towards student loan forgiveness programs that require a certain minimum of payments to be made. That's a bit complicated, so let me just give you a quick example. A student loan borrower would, over the years, contact their student loan servicer, and they would ask for an affordable repayment plan. And the, borrow, the servicer could put a borrower into an affordable income-driven repayment plan. And the way these payment plans work is that after 20 or 25 years, your remaining debt is erased. Instead, a student loan servicing company would do the quickest option, which was easier for their customer service agents, and that would be to enroll someone in a forbearance, which is an emergency pause on their payments. The problem is that this time in forbearance did, is short term, and it didn't get them any closer to having their student loans erased. The Department of Education has realized, okay, this is wrong. These folks have been paying for, for two decades. They should have their student loans erased if they were pushed into the wrong repayment, repayment program. So if you were put into forbearance for 12 or more months consecutively or 36 or more months cumulatively, uh, then you will be able to have credits counted towards these payments, counting towards student loan forgiveness. Uh, and also this type of readjustment uh, will count for those who spent months in deferment prior to 2013. So this, this, just to summarize it, for folks who should have been enrolled in an affordable repayment program, but had their payments put on pause because a servicer told them to, there may be a chance that they are closer to student loan forgiveness under the other federal programs than they even realize. All right, with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Selena to talk about uh, public service loan forgiveness, and then we can jump back in later to talk about some other updates that are really exciting. So Selena, take it away again from here. Yeah, thank you, Cody. So public service loan forgiveness, a lot of you may have been hearing about PSLF and a waiver and things that are going on. Well, let me give you a little bit of background. PSLF was a program that was created in 2007 to encourage individuals to enter and remain in public service where they may earn less than those in, pri in private service. Um, under the program, student loan forgiveness is granted after satisfying certain criteria for 10 years. The traditional requirements of PSLF are that a borrower has to have the right type of loan, so they have to have a direct loan. Um, at any Department of Education owned and backed loan. They have to have the right type of repayment plan. Um, they have to be on an income-driven repayment plan. Then they have to have the qualifying employer. So they have to have be employed full-time, which is at least 30 hours or what the employer considers full-time and have to be employed by a qualified government agency. It can be um, at the city, county, state level, municipal, military, and tribal also is a qualifying employer or a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Um, at the same time, the borrower has to be making payments on these loans. So they have to have 120 payments. They do not have to be consecutive. And um, then the balance gets forgiven. Sounds simple, correct? Next, please. Well, in 2017, when the first batch of uh, borrowers applied for PSLF, there was a 99% denial rate for not meeting the requirements. This has to do with what Cody was talking about, just uh, borrowers being placed in, just not being provided the correct information, being placed on forbearance and deferment, servicers just not acting in the best interest and not providing correct information to borrowers. So therefore, this limited waiver was created in October of last year. Under the waiver, most of the PSLF qualifying payment rules have been suspended through the end of this month. Borrowers should apply even if they were denied before or if they do not have the 120 qualifying payments. Uh, approximately 130,000 borrowers have received forgiveness since its announcement relative to fewer than 20,000 before the waiver. And I'm sure at this point, these numbers are a lot higher. Next, please. So let's go over some of the waiver 
requirements and the changes. So under the traditional requirement, a borrower has to have a direct loan. Well, a lot of those borrowers with those older FFEL, FEL, Perkins, um, or other federal loans that did not qualify can cons are able to consolidate their loans into direct loans to be able to enroll in PSLF. When they do that, they will receive credit for previous payments made on those loans, even though, even though those weren't traditionally qualifying loans. Parent PLUS loans are not included unless they are consolidated with the, borrow, with the parent's own student loans. Um, for the employment requirement, the employment requirement has not changed. The requirements are still the same. The only thing that has changed under the waiver is that the borrow borrower does not need to be in the qualifying employment at the time of forgiveness. So this benefits borrowers that have moved on to private service, maybe have retired, but they have the 120 payments and the employment time. And then the qualifying payments. So Prior to this, if um, during prior to the PSLF waiver, if a borrower made um, an overpayment, if a borrower was one cent under, one day late, servicers were not acting in the best interest of borrowers, and they were just not giving borrowers credit towards PSLF. So now, any past periods of repayment, whether or not you made that repay that payment on time for the full amount due or on a qualifying repayment plan will, counts toward, will count towards PSLF. As Cody mentioned, the IDR, the one-time adjustment, the certain periods of forbearance and deferment may count where, when, where they don't traditionally count. Also, all the months that have been spent un, in, under COVID forbearance, that's almost 30 months of borrowers not making payments, all these months will count towards PSLF. Again, this is under the waiver um, and even after the waiver, but all these COVID months will count and borrowers can get closer to forgiveness, if not entire, the balance entirely forgiven. Next, please. So what does a borrower need to do? Uh, well, first of all, a borrower needs to find out if the employer is a qualified public service employer. Um, as I mentioned, some of the requirements are government agency and nonprofit 501c3. The federal student aid, they have an employer eligibility search tool where a borrower can search for the employer using their employer's federal employee ID number. The FEIN number, you can find it on your W-2 form. You can Google the information. I help borrowers every day, help them find their employer's FEIN, but they can log on to the student aid employer search. They don't need to create an account. They can enter the FEIN and just uh, employment dates, and they will see if the employer has already been um, certified or is eligible. So that means that either someone in that agency has already applied or is going through PSLF. You may not find the employer there. That doesn't necessarily mean that your employer does not qualify. It may only mean that no one has gone through the process. Then you need to find out what type of loans you have. And this is going to be important for any of these programs that we're speaking about today. It is very important that you find out what type of loans you have. I get questions every day with borrowers asking what they can do, how can they qualify, and really the first step is to find out what loans you have. Again, you can log on to the studentaid.gov page, um, create an account, and there you will find all the inf information regarding your federal loans, including those Fell and Perkins loans. Um, you will find, uh, you can download your aid data and you will see there um, whether the loan is, you will see the word direct, you will see the word fell or Perkins to determine what type of loans you have. Then if you have those older loans um, that benefit the most from this waiver, a borrower has to consolidate their loans. So again, the consolidation is completed through the studentaid.gov page 
At this point, they will not receive an answer. Um, they will complete the process, complete the application, which takes about 30 minutes, um, but they will not get an official confirmation until after the 31st. So it's very important that a borrower uses the studentaid.gov page to um, do the consolidation. Um, one note on that, if a borrower, with so many changes going on, um, at this point, we were just, we just found out that if a borrower consolidates their fell loans with the with direct loans, which they can do, and it's the action that a borrower has to take, they will not be eligible for the Biden relief that Cody will be talking about. So um, it's very important just to make sure you know that and you understand that before consolidating. Depending on the loan balance, though, it, PSLF may be the best path for you to get forgiveness this way, um, or you might want to just choose to um, go through the through the relief. So um, Cody will talk more about that, but it's important that you understand what consolidating will do to um, you'll lose out on the Biden relief if you if you are consolidating your direct loans with your foul loans. Um, if you consolidated prior to September 29th, you're still okay. But if you're doing that from now until the 31st, um, you will lose out on that. Um, so the waiver period ends October 31st. Any borrower that wants to benefit under the waiver has to has to start the PSLF application. They have to use the PSLF help tool to start the application. They fill it out. They will download it and print it, and then they will need to get their employer signature. The consolidation also needs to be done on the studentaid.gov page by October 31st. So you do not have to finish the process by the 31st, but you do have to make sure that you use the studentaid.gov site to complete these actions. The next one, please. And this is just a, this is the actual application. So this is the one that you will be completing, completing on the PSLF help tool. Um, the borrower will complete basically all the information Again, make sure that you have those FEIN numbers correct. If you do it through the self-help tool, um, it will actually upload that information for you and you'll, able to, you'll be able to verify that they are a qualifying employer. When you print this, you will have to download and print this application. It's just very important that borrowers make sure that the information is neat, the dates are complete. You don't wanna have a denial or a delay because your employer wrote, um, the month and year and no, or just a year, um, make sure that the information is legible. Um, you will re be requiring an actual signature. So these do need to be printed and sent to your employer. Um, if you are not able to uh, get in touch with your employer or they're not being responsive, please feel free to reach out to me. I can try and, and contact them for you. If they have already closed or are, are out of business. Um, you can, there is an option where, you, where you're not able to submit the signature and you will have to submit documentation. Um, but again, that process will delay um, the process a little bit more because they do have to verify that information. So just try your best to get these signed and just make sure they are clear and legible. Once you're done with these, these will get mailed or uploaded to Mojila, who, as I mentioned before, is the PSLF servicer. So again, the this is for the, the waiver ends on the 31st. It's very important for people to know the program is not ending. The program will continue with those traditional requirements. So right now, those that we urge to take action or we recommend really look into the, this are those that have been in public service for many years that have been paying on their student loans and have not applied before or were or applied before. But even for those newer um, public employees, go ahead and apply just to make sure you're on track and you're certifying. Um, but don't worry, you will not lose out after October 31st. Um, and the next one, I believe now we're jumping into the student debt relief. So now back to Cody. Awesome. Uh, Selena, you had the tough part because explaining public service loan forgiveness is challenging. The good news is that the new uh, Biden administration student debt relief plan is very simple. Um, and to be clear, before I even jump into uh, this plan, I want to be 
clear about the fact that a borrower is eligible for all of these programs combined for the most part. So she, uh, Selena talked about public service loan forgiveness. I'm now talking about a different student debt relief plan that anyone can take advantage of, even if they're interested in public service loan forgiveness. Uh, so what is this really uh, visible and um, new student debt relief plan? Well, broad-based relief of up to $10,000 or up to $20,000 uh, is available to student loan borrowers who earn under $125,000 uh, per individual or under $250,000 for married couples and heads of household. Uh, I, there's two numbers there, 10 or 20. What matters is if you received a Pell Grant of any size and at any time during your college education. So a Pell Grant recipient is eligible for up to $20,000, while a borrower who has student loans but never received a Pell Grant is available uh, for student debt can, uh, relief up to $10,000. And I wanna be clear about one other thing because I've heard this come up several times. If you're a parent and you received a Pell Grant 30 years ago for your own education, and now you have parent plus loans for your children's education, that still makes you eligible for the $20,000 in student debt cancellation. So it really is all about, did you ever get a Pell Grant that opens up the door for an additional 10,000 in relief? Now, we had spent a year plus advocating for student debt cancellation that was automatic for all borrowers. Our fear was that an application would create a lot of challenges that would make it difficult for many borrowers to apply. The bad news is we didn't get that. We got an application. The good news is the application is as simple as it could be. It takes just a few minutes to go to studentaid.gov, submit your first name, your last name, your email address, your social security number, and a checkbox, along with a few other basic information to apply for this relief. I've never seen a program, a government benefit, this big, this powerful, and this easy to apply for. So there's no excuse not to go to studentaid.gov to submit this application. Uh, that's the summary information. For the most part, borrowers with this, these few points can figure out if they are eligible, but there are some nuanced cases. So if you wanna learn more, Again, there's another page at studentaid.gov. It's studentaid.gov slash debt-relief-announcement. And if you go there, you can read all about this plan uh, along with some FAQs regarding uh, some more nuanced cases for borrowers that have unique situations. Uh, so debt cancellation will ha happen. You will be able to apply starting now all the way up till December, the end of December of 20. 23. But as a reminder, student loan payments are set to restart in January of 2023. So what we have been told from the Department of Education is that if you apply before November 17th, you will get your, your 10 or $20,000 in student debt relief before January 1st when payments resume. So you can apply anytime between now and the end of 2023. But if you apply before the middle of November, you'll get your relief before the end of this year. Uh, along with this plan, the president announced that he will be uh, creating a new income-driven repayment plan. And this is a part of the plan that really hasn't gotten as much attention, but it's incredibly powerful because what this has set into motion is that there will be a future, there will be in the future, a new income-driven repayment plan available that lowers people's monthly payments even more. And so millions of people who are enrolled in a program have lower payments and are still struggling will now have a new option that should make relief for borrowers even more generous. That piece of this plan is in the works, it's in the rulemaking process and won't be available to borrowers for some time, but the process has started. Uh, let's go to the next slide here. So I already, uh, you know, spoiler alert, I already said it, but the student debt relief application is officially live. Uh, in fact, it was beta tested over the weekend. 
with 8 million people applying in the first few days. As of uh, today, over 12 million people have applied. So really, now is the time for borrowers to go apply. The system is working as intended. Folks are able to submit this application within minutes. Next slide, please. So I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I want to make sure folks have the information they need. You can apply for student debt relief at studentaid.gov. In fact, it's on the front page. You can go to studentaid.gov right now, and the first thing you're going to see is this. To get straight to the form, the full uh, URL is there at studentaid.gov slash debt dash relief slash application. The deadline to apply, again, is the end of December of next year. The application literally takes minutes. It took me probably a minute and a half. That's how quick you can do this. Uh, the application is available online via mobile devices. It's available in English and in Spanish. And you probably noticed, I haven't said it yet, there is no paper application at this moment, but it is in the works. I, I spoke with officials at the Department of Education today, and they implied that a form in paper version is very close which is great because we're hearing from folks who are older, who have disabilities, who are, are less tech savvy and who just generally cannot use an online application, they still deserve relief. So a paper application is on the way. All right, and I you know, kind of alluded to it, but this is what you need to apply. First name, a middle initial, a last name, your social security number, your date of birth, your contact information, and then you're gonna check off a box saying that the information you, that you uh, are signing off, that you qualify based on the income requirements. Uh, after you apply, you will get a confirmation email. I got mine within seconds saying you have applied. Uh, the Department of Education on their end will verify your eligibility. They're gonna determine the level of relief you uh, are qualifying for based on if you received a Pell Grant or not. And for some borrowers, uh, they may reach out for additional income information. So what that means is even though you apply and you get the confirmation email, keep an eye out for an email from the Department of Education. They are going to randomly audit these applications and choose some folks to uh, submit income information. You may be that borrower. It will be easy to submit this information, but if you if you forget to respond to this email, you'll be missing out on relief. Uh, once your application is processed, you will be notified and your student loan servicer will apply the cancellation to your loans. Now, nearly all federal student loans are eligible for this kind of relief, but I wanna go through um, a little, with a little more detail. So if you have a direct loan that was dispersed before June 30th, on or before June 30th of 2022, this year, you qualify. Direct loans can be subsidized, unsubsidized. They can be direct loans for parents, direct loans for graduate students, and they can be consolidated direct loans as well. Direct loans are newer student loans. These are the types of student loans that all borrowers have received since 2010. What this means is that the money for your loan comes directly from the Department of Education. If you've gone to school at any time and gone to student loans since 2010, it's almost certain that you have a direct federal loan. Now, older borrowers and borrowers who went to school prior to 2010 did have other options available. So there are loans that are called federal family education loans, and there are loans that are called Perkins loans. Some of these are eligible for this relief. And what really matters here is who holds your loan. Some FFEL and some Perkins loans are held by the Department of Education, the government, and others are held by commercial banks. A quick trick, if you have an FFEL loan or a Perkins loan and your payments have been on pause automatically during the pandemic, then you have a federally held loan, you're good to go. Uh, and then defaulted loans of any kind. If your loan is in default, the Department of Education holds that loan and you qualify for this relief. 
Now we had to add an amendment at the bottom here in red. Uh, this was a new update that really has changed things up a bit. And you can see here, it says, as of September 29th, privately owned FFEL or Perkins loans are not eligible for debt relief under the plan. Just weeks ago, it was our understanding that if you had an FFEL loan or Perkins loan that was not held by the government, that you would be able to consolidate your loans into a new direct loan that the department owned, and that would make you eligible. That is no longer the case as of 929. And I can get into a whole conversation about why that's the case. That's not important. Just what is important is that you can no longer consolidate your loans to become eligible if you are not eligible at this time. Next slide, please. So anytime there is uh, really important, awesome news for borrowers, there's also really bad, terrible scams out there that are trying to take advantage of borrowers. We, we tend to call these debt relief scams. Uh, so these student loan scams will reach out to you by telephone, by email, and by mail. And they'll often look very official. Some, if they're illegal, will say they're working for the Department of Education. Uh, as a reminder, the Department of Education will never call you. Uh, they'll never contact you via social media. Uh, they will interact with you through the mail and through your online accounts and through your student loan servicer. These scams are often too good to be true scams. These are people who promise to immediately eliminate your debt. Uh, and of course, it's often for a fee. We did research a few years ago. We found the average borrower spent $600 on these scams uh, for either services that were useless or services they could have done themselves online at the Department of Education. Um, they also will, will make all these too good to be true promises. They'll say that you have special access to repayment plans uh, that will seriously lower your monthly payments. Uh, they'll offer to consolidate your loans or, or act as um, uh, you know, your representative or they'll sign, you, they'll sign you up for some sort of uh, subscription service to manage your debt. None of these things are necessary. A borrower who wants a lower monthly payment or wants to apply for loan forgiveness can go to their loan servicing company or the Department of Education directly at no cost. Um, and the last two red flags, again, they'll ask for a payment. They want a fee. None of this costs money. All of these federal programs are your right as a federal student loan borrower. And they often want your information. They want your ID, your username, your password, your personal information. All of these are red flags. So I'm just gonna say it one last time because it's, I can't say it enough. You can do this all yourself online at the Department of Education or with your student loan servicer. You virtually never have to pay a professional for student loan services, especially if you have a federal student loan. Uh, and there are places to submit information. So you can file a complaint with the student, with the Department of Education at studentaid.gov. Uh, you can submit a complaint with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau at consumerfinance.gov. And of course, we have Selena and our friends here from the California DFPI at dfpi.ca.gov. And I would always encourage a borrower to submit a complaint with all of these agencies. Not only can some help, but the only way for them to perform their enforcement actions and to hold student loan companies accountable is to get information from borrowers who are actually impacted. All right, that was a ton of information. Now we can jump into questions, I'm excited. Okay, thank you, Cody. I know that's a lot of information. Uh, we have about five minutes for, Q, for questions. Um, Sam, do you have some questions lined up for us? Yeah, thanks everyone. So we'll try to get through these as fast as we can. So we had an earlier one about Biden's announcement. Um, so someone mentioned in January, they heard that in January, if someone pays a minimum payment, they won't be charged to interest. I think what this person is asking about, and I, we didn't get to touch on it, so uh, about the new IDR plans that came along with uh, President Biden's announcement around debt cancellation. So I don't know if Cody or Selena, can you mention just something what we do know about the potentially proposed IDR plans that are coming up? Yeah, I can start here. Um, and I... 
Sam, I think your, your intuition is correct there. Um, so there will be a new income driven repayment plan available. It is not currently available and it will not be available in January when payments begin. It is going through a rulemaking process. So this will be something for, for borrowers in the future. But what this borrower is getting at is the way this plan is designed is that when a borrower is enrolled in an affordable repayment program, traditionally their payments can be so low that interest is accruing on their account. And so a borrower would see their loan balance grow over time, even though they were enrolled in a program. And that completely defeated the purpose of the program because you would instill a bunch of fear and distrust in a borrower who was actually doing the right thing. The new program, you can lower your monthly payment and no matter how low your payment is adjusted under these programs, you will not have interest accruing on your account. Uh, so borrowers who do everything right will no longer be um, seeing their loan balances increase instead of going down. So stay tuned. That will not be available on January 1st, though. Thanks, Cody. All right. We get a lot of these questions around public service loan forgiveness and kind of the requirements around them. So we get this pr question pretty often. Um, but can you make more than 12 payments a year or just more payments than the 120 that's required? Uh, no. So the way the public service loan forgiveness program works that you have to make 120 qualifying monthly payments, but you cannot make multiple payments in a month or one large payment to get ahead. So when we say 120 monthly payments, that means that you have to at least be making payments for 10 years, right? That's 120 months. Um, so, you know, we hear that question a lot, Sam, you're right, but borrowers should just under these programs pay what is asked of them. And, and you know, there's really no incentive, I guess, to pay more than is asked of you if you expect to have your student loans forgiven after 10 years. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Cody. Um, and then maybe time for one more, maybe two more, but, uh, so there's a lot of questions around the FFEL or FEL loans that you all mentioned. Um, so let's be clear about how can folks find out if they have an FFEL loan that is eligible for, um, let's say, the for forgiveness here. So how can we figure out if they have the privately held one or the publicly held one and which one kind of, again, applies for which debt forgiveness? So again, a borrower is going to have to log on to studentaid.gov, download their aid data, because they may have a mix. So they may have direct loans, depending on when they went to school, they may have some of the qualifying direct loans, and they may have some of those fell Perkins loans. So it's, it's going to start there. So they need to find out what they have, really sit down and say, okay, this is, these are my fell, um, my fell loans, my direct loans, and this is the plan that I want to apply for, or that I'm hoping to get either the Biden relief, because I see that a lot of people want to know if they qualify for both. So they may, I mean, you can qualify for both, but uh, finding downloading your data and getting that information if you do not have if you if your information is not on studentaid.gov or you're paying like I said through one of those banks or one of the ones I mentioned then you do have a private loan but st on studentaid.gov you will see Fell Perkins you will see the name of the loan and then you can go from there all right and we are at time so I'll, I'll hand it back to you Ku. Thank you, Sam. Um, I do have a couple more slides just really quickly. Again, um, we're, we're right at the end, but two big reminders. Don't forget, at the end of this month, the public service loan forgiveness waiver um, is, is over. So make sure you get the PSLF help tool done um, if you can. Uh, and also the student loan repayment pause, uh, the student loan repayment pause ends at the end of this year. Payments restart in January. So um, if you can't get debt, if your loan is not completely forgiven, um, just be aware that it's going to start back up in January and make plans accordingly. Um, uh, finally, we do have a lot of different resources. I'm not going to go through all these links, just the big one at the top, which is uh, the DFEI has a web page dedicated towards um, the student loan information. It's got a lot of resources. It's got a list of webinars that are upcoming. Um, 
please go to that web page uh, and you'll review all the information at the very bottom is a list of government agencies, nonprofits, uh, also uh, legal groups, um, nonprofit legal groups that provide assistance to student borrowers. So again, go to that website, um, get the information you need um, to, to help yourself. Um, and then one last thing is uh, subscribe to the DFPI. So the DFPI has a monthly newsletter um, we inform everyone of upcoming webinars, events, um, not just about you know, student loan, but also consumer alerts and all that. So subscribe to us if you have the chance. Uh, and finally, here's the contact information for Selena Damien, the DFPI student loan ombudsperson. Um, these slides will be made available to everyone who registered the webinar. The webinar is also being recorded and a link will be emailed to your registration address uh, your email address that you registered with. So you can rewatch the webinar if you want to, um, and also, again, have access to the slides. Um, finally, thank you, big, big special thank you to Assembly Member Reyes, Assembly Member Bloom, and also Assembly Member uh, Rambla for helping us put this thing together. And um, it's uh, been great. I want to also thank the panelists for a great presentation and have a good night. Please take care of each other. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.